Chapter 1, Survey of Views from the Middle Ages to 1962. It was during the High Middle Ages that canonists and theologians began to systematically discuss what adherence the Christian faithful should give to specific doctrines. There had been sporadic treatments of this question prior to this time, but they did not leave an imprint on the conversation among scholars that had extended from the Middle Ages until today. The first three sections of this survey, spanning the High Middle Ages to 1863, is primarily based on secondary sources. Excellent surveys already exist of the thoughts of canonists and theologians during this period on the subject of the Church's teaching authority. The Middle Ages. Non-definitive authoritative doctrine was rarely discussed before the late 19th century. Most theologians who wrote about the Church's teaching authority focused either on definitive, that is infallibly taught doctrines, or on the acts of councils and popes that were merely disciplinary or lacked any authority whatsoever. To discover whether they were aware of levels of teaching in between these two extremes, it is necessary to determine which acts they considered definitive and which acts they considered less than authoritative. Set these categories aside and see if anything remains. The Infallibility of the Faithful Although for many Catholics the word infallible is instantly associated with the word pope, papal infallibility is only one piece of the doctrine of infallibility and not the most ancient one. As Francis Sullivan has written, while the first known reference to the infallibility of ecumenical councils dates from the ninth century and the first reference to the infallibility of popes to the 13th century, the conviction that the consensus of the universal church in its faith is an infallible norm of truth goes back to the second century with Irenaeus and is a consistent element of Christian belief. Irenaeus, Tertullian, Gregory Nianzen, Basil, Cassian, Eunomius, Epiphanius, Jerome, Augustine, Vincent of Lorenz, and Nicophorus all agreed that the universal belief of the Christian faithful is a sure guide to true doctrine. On multiple occasions, Augustine settled doctrinal disputes by invoking dogma populare, receiving these doctrines held by divine faith by all Christians, from bishops to lay faithful, penitents, and catechumens. Vincent of Lorenz stated that the test of orthodoxy is that, quote, which is believed everywhere and always by all, end quote. The medieval canonists held this view as well. Bonaventure considered it most horrible and unbelievable that God would permit his holy people to err as a whole. Exactly what quantity as a whole referred to was rarely spelled out. Some theologians understood this to mean that when the church was sufficiently unified to form a consensus on a matter of doctrine, this consensus could not be wrong. William of Ockham held a more unusual view, that is, he insisted that only perfect unanimity on a point of doctrine assured its truth, and therefore it was possible that heresy could become nearly universal in the church, with the true doctrine preserved only by a minuscule and unnoticed remnant. From what I have been able to determine, none of these authorities proposed that lesser degrees of authority might correspond to lesser degrees of unanimity. In other words, they asserted that whenever 100% of Christians believed a certain doctrine to be revealed, that doctrine was certainly true, but they never indicated that it would be significant if some doctrine was believed by 80% of Christians or 51% of Christians. The Authority of a General Council The early ecumenical councils were held as reliable judges of faith by the Church Fathers. Around 370, Athanasius wrote that the word of the Lord, which came through the ecumenical council at Nicaea, remains forever. In 591, Gregory the Great wrote of his reverence for the first four ecumenical councils for, on them, as on a cornerstone, 
rises the structure of the holy faith. The fifth council, too, I equally venerate. Moreover, many of the fathers held that the great councils had been guided by the Holy Spirit. However, it is unclear whether they understood ecumenical councils in general as being infallible. Infallibility is a stronger concept than inerrancy. That is, it indicates not only the absence of error, but the guarantee that error cannot be present if certain conditions are met. If councils are infallible, then one can be sure that a future council, or a council in the past whose documents one has not yet read, cannot teach error in its solemn definitions. It is possible that the early fathers believed in the inerrancy of the councils of their time merely because, having examined their documents, they found no error in them. The first theologian to describe ecumenical councils as infallible in the strict sense was Theodore Abu Kora, a 9th century Syrian monk and bishop. According to Abu Kora, just as the apostles in the Council of Jerusalem were guided by the Holy Spirit, Acts 15, 28, so too are the bishops in an ecumenical council protected from error. Although it is unlikely that Abu Kora was known in the West, by the high Middle Ages it was widely held among Western European canonists and theologians that general councils did not err when they defined a matter of faith to be held by all the faithful. Historian Brian Tierney concludes from a survey of the medieval canonists that they, quote, never envisioned the possibility that the council could have erred in faith. Beginning around the year 1200, the canonists argued for the inerrancy of councils from the inerrancy of the whole church as a council was seen as the whole church acting as a corporate body. There was no suggestion that a council might choose to teach a matter of faith at a lesser level of authority. William of Ockham was an exception to this consensus as well, holding that a general council was not immune from error. Yet, like his opponents, he never mentioned the possibility that different levels of authority might be associated with different conciliar teachings on matters of faith. Canonists and theologians did distinguish between a council's teachings on faith and its disciplinary edicts. A council's disciplinary legislation could be revised by a pope or a future council, but when a council defined an article of faith, this was permanently binding. It was recognized, however, that a single conciliar decree might have both doctrinal and disciplinary aspects. It was also held that legislation concerning the generalis status ecclesiae, such as statutes regarding church polity and the sacraments, might be irrevocable even if they were not actually doctrinal. When medieval canonists or theologians discussed a general council, they usually envisioned a council that had been summoned by a pope, attended by a pope or his legates, and whose documents were ultimately approved by a pope. The authority of such a council was universally acknowledged. On the other hand, there was great disagreement regarding the scenario of a pope and a council in conflict with each other. Some held that a pope had supreme authority even acting alone, while others held his authority to be strictly less than that of a council. Some held that a council without a pope's sanction lacked authority, while others placed it above the pope. This dispute will not be explored here, given the dissertation's scope. The authority of a pope. What teaching authority did a pope, acting without a council, possess? In the Middle Ages, popes did not typically act as teachers except when offering judgments on disputed issues. Gretchen taught that scholars of Scripture are preeminent over even the pope when interpreting and expounding Scripture, while the pope is preeminent on matters that must be defined. In causis ferro definindis. As such definitions require not only knowledge, but the power to rule. Such definitions could be disciplinary or doctrinal. Thus, the English canonist Alanus stated that a pope's definition, definitio, can create a new article of faith, even though this would be merely a new expression of the truths contained in the deposit of faith, 
this new formulation imposed an irrevocable obligation on the Catholic faithful. Similarly, Thomas Aquinas wrote that a pope had the authority to draw up a new symbol of faith. Historians today are divided on the interpretation of these claims. Some hold that Alanis and Thomas were discussing the Pope's own authority to define dogmas, while others believe that Alanis and Thomas were referring to the power of a general council under the leadership of a Pope. John Peter Olivi, a member of the spiritual wing of the Franciscan order, was the first theologian known to unambiguously assert that a Pope can define a new dogma without the help of a council. In 1279, Pope Nicholas III promulgated the bull Exit, which praised the Franciscans and seemed to endorse their belief that their lifestyle was a perfect imitation of the poverty that Christ and his apostles practiced. A year or so later, Olivi wrote his Questiones de Perfectione Evangelica, which included the question, whether the Roman pontiff is to be obeyed by all Catholics as an unerring standard, tam quam regule irabilii, in faith and morals. Olivi answered this question in the affirmative, while making it clear that he was referring solely to a pope's public teaching on matters of faith. The spiritual Franciscans continued to receive papal encouragement until the reign of John the Twenty-Second. In 1322, John repealed some of the disciplinary rules in Exeit, and the next year he issued a doctrinal statement, cum inter non nullos, which rejected the claim that Christ had lived a life of poverty exactly as the Franciscans did. In 1324, the Franciscans rejected the Pope's claim, citing Olivi's book as proof that papal teachings on doctrine were infallible, and arguing from this thesis that several popes, Gregory IX, Alexander IV, and especially Nicholas III in Exeit, had infallibly taught that Christ's poverty and Franciscan poverty were identical. Pope John refuted this argument in his bull, Quia, Corundum Mentes, in 1324. After abutting Olivi's understanding of the key of power and the key of knowledge, John went through the decrees his predecessors had issued regarding poverty and explained why each of these decrees lacked the qualities necessary for a dogmatic definition. John's treatment of these texts merits close examination, as it shows how a 14th century scholar identified dogmatic definitions. He offered arguments based on specific terminology. For example, he pointed out that when Alexander IV taught about Christ's poverty, he condemned anyone who might reject his teaching as, quote, cotomatious and as a rebel to the Roman Church, Cantumax et Ecclesiae Romane Re Biliis, a milder censure than calling such views heretical, hereticus. He made arguments based on the scope of the Church's teaching authority, questioning whether details of Christ's and the Apostles' ownership of things pertains to faith and morals, ad fidem fel mores pereneat. He illuminated the meaning of these statements by citing other documents written by their authors. Thus, when the Franciscans cited statements by Alexander IV and Gregory IV comparing Franciscan poverty to Christ's, John pointed out that these popes had also compared Dominican poverty to Christ's. But since these two orders followed different styles of poverty, these popes cannot have meant that Christ's poverty was in every way identical to that practiced by the Franciscans. Having shown, by means of such arguments, that none of these previous popes had the intention to issue a dogmatic definition on this matter, John concluded that the Franciscans were wrong in claiming that our predecessors have defined, definitiae, such things. Yet at no point did John the Twenty-Second deny that a pope could define a doctrine in such a way that it would be binding on his successors. Indeed, when he was later accused by Michael of Cesena of having done so, he insisted that he had not. His apologist, Jessalyn de Casagnes, 
asserted that John himself had issued a dogmatic definition in cum inter non nullos, basing this claim on the Pope's wording, We declare that certain claims about Christ's poverty will henceforth be justly considered erroneous and heretical. The next theologian to write a treatise on papal infallibility was Guido Tereni, who published his Questio de Magisterio Infallibii Romani Pontificis between 1328 and 1339. Francis Sullivan concurs with the judgment of Bartolome Exiberta that Terini's theology is so close to that of the First Vatican Council that had he written it, his treatise, after Vatican I, he would have had to add or change hardly a single word. Terani stated that a pope could not err in his definitions of the faith, determinationes fidei, although he could err in matters not related to salvation. Throughout his treatise, he limits the pope's infallibility to matters of fides, except in one passage where he also includes bonemores. One of his arguments supporting papal infallibility is based on two premises. These are, first, the whole church cannot err in matters of faith. Second, the Pope is the universal teacher of the church. Therefore, if the Pope were to teach falsely, the whole church would be led into error, which is impossible. This argument, which roots the infallibility of the teaching church in the infallibility of the whole church's belief, would be repeated by many scholars up to Vatican I. Moreover, while admitting that a pope could become a heretic as a private person, Tereni argues that no papal definition will ever be false. If a pope were to intend to define a false doctrine, God would prevent him from doing so, quote, either by death or by the resistance of other people or in some other manner. Although the ability of a pope to issue definitive teachings without calling an ecumenical council was a matter in dispute, all Catholics recognized that the pope did exercise real authority when he issued official teachings on matters of faith. Such teachings were distinguished from his acts as a private doctor. One canonist illustrated this distinction by stating that if the Pope and Augustine each wrote books of theology in his own private room, the book by Augustine should be preferred by theologians. But if the Pope defined something that concerned articles of faith, his definition would have more authority than anything Augustine wrote. Popes themselves made use of this distinction. Thus, Pope Innocent III, replying to a bishop regarding a Christological question, wrote thus, We give you this response in our capacity as a scholar, but if we must respond in our apostolic capacity, we respond more simply, indeed, but more cautiously. Pope Innocent IV published a commentary on the Decretals, which was recognized as the work of a private doctor, and was widely used in the schools. And when Pope John XXII scandalized many in his teachings regarding the beatific vision in the 1330s, he insisted that he was not teaching this authoritatively, but as a private doctor. Identifying Levels of Authority Although they differ on many details, Olivi, Tereni, and apparently John XXII himself agree that the Pope can issue infallible dogmatic definitions under certain limited conditions. Logically, it would seem to follow from this that papal teaching on matters of faith can be divided into two levels of authority, that is, those which satisfy such conditions and those which do not. The former are infallibly taught, the latter are not. For this reason, Francis Sullivan concludes that these late medieval theologians recognized at least two levels of authority in papal teachings, roughly equivalent to the modern distinction between so-called extraordinary and so-called ordinary papal teachings. However, Tierney disagrees, arguing that no such distinction is found until the modern era. After the first distinction of his Origins of Papal Infallibility was published, many of his critics challenged him on this point, and he replied to them in a postscript added in the second edition.
While these critics were able to make very strong arguments, asserting that medieval theologians must have understood the difference between infallible and fallible papal teaching, and for that matter, infallible and fallible conciliar teaching, none of them were able to supply any instances of a theologian actually referring to this distinction. As a result, neither side seems to have been able to convince the other. Based on this absence of explicit reference to non-definitive authoritative teaching among medieval theologians, it seems likely that those theologians who wrote about papal and conciliar infallibility in this era were so focused on infallible teachings that they neglected to discuss what level of authority, if any, their non-infallible teachings possessed. Of course, as has been noted, theologians recognized that popes often issued disciplinary decrees, decrees dealing with matters unrelated to faith, and theological writings as private doctors, none of which were definitive. But papal teachings that were doctrinal and public, and yet were not definitively taught, a category that is logically implied by these theologians' admission that not all doctrinal teachings are definitive, do not seem to have been systematically considered during this era. In conclusion, medieval canonists and theologians who studied the decrees of councils and popes distinguished between doctrinal and disciplinary decrees, between teachings on matters of faith and teachings on secular subjects, and between the official teaching of a pope and his teaching as a private doctor. Within the realm of official doctrinal teachings, they recognize that certain teachings qualified as definitive or infallible, but they do not seem to have explored this distinction to the point of explicitly distinguishing multiple levels of authority among authoritative doctrinal teachings. Theological Notes In the High Middle Ages, many popes had been trained as canonists rather than as theologians. When theological controversies arose, popes would sometimes issue condemnations of certain ideas through documents that were prepared with the help of commissions of theologians. In the 14th century, these papal condemnations began to use certain theological terms to criticize the content of specific assertions. For instance, heretica, erronia, malesonans, suspecta de heresiae, and so on. These terms did not seem to attract much attention until they were used by the Council of Constance, 1414 to 1418, in three separate documents. These would eventually become known as theological censures, or more generally, theological notes. The term theological notes includes positive negative, and somewhat neutral assessments of propositions, while the term theological censures includes only the negative theological notes. The earliest histories of these censures is unknown today. Although they probably originated in the theological schools, by the 15th century they were associated primarily with documents of popes and councils. As a result, a number of theologians, beginning with St. Antonius of Florence, died 1459, attempted to deduce the meaning of these censures by studying the magisterial documents in which they appeared. In hindsight, it seems strange that these theologians did not simply write to Rome or Avignon and ask them to explain what each of these censures meant. Yet, never in that era or any time since has there been explanation from any office of the teaching church concerning the meaning of these censures. So, Theologians tried to learn their meaning by studying their use in official documents. Observing the sequence in which the notes appeared, perhaps they were listed in order of weight. Determining whether two notes never appeared together in the same document, perhaps they were synonyms. And critiquing earlier theologians' explanation of these notes. A monograph by John Cahill investigates the results obtained by these theologians, namely, St. Antonius of Florence, Order of Preachers, died 1459, Juan de Torquemada, Order of Preachers, 1489, Silvestro Mazzoloni da Pierino, Order of Preachers, Alfonso de Castro, Orders Friars Minor, 1547, Diego Didacus de Simancos, 1552, 
Melchior Canto, Order of Preachers, 1563. Domingo Bañez, Order of Preachers, 1584. Pedro de Lorca, Order of Cistercians, died 1606. Francisco Suarez, Society of Jesus, died 1617. Juan de Lugo, Society of Jesus, 1646. Lorenzo Brancati de Lorinia, Orders Friar Minor Conventionals, 1673. The Carmelites of Salamanca, 1679. And Antonio de Panoromo, 1709. In addition, he briefly considers theologians who wrote about these centuries in later centuries, including Gaspard Huen, 1704, Domenico Viva, Society of Jesus, 1708, Vincenzo Lodovico Gotti, Order of Preachers, 1727, Honore Tonelli, died 1729, Claude Louis de Montaigne, 1732, Heinrich Kilber, Society of Jesus, 1751, Joseph Gautier, Society of Jesus, 1756, Matthias Joseph Schaben, 1867, Johann Baptist Franzelein, Society of Jesus, 1870, Camillo Mazella, Society of Jesus, 1879, Christian Pesch, Society of Jesus, 1894, Louis Billot, Society of Jesus, 1898, J.V. de Groot, Order of Preachers, circa 1900. Reginaldo Maria Schultes, Order of Preachers, died 1928. And Reginald Gerigru Lagrange, Order of Preachers, 1938. Cahill's project was to determine the meaning of each individual note and censure, and his book is arranged accordingly. Thus he groups together each theologian's interpretation of a rese proxima, close to heresy, error, which has a specific meaning as a censure, even though the Latin word has a generic meaning. Priarum ariarum offensiva, offensive to pious ears, and so on. Since the goal of this dissertation is to search for information on the lower levels of magisterial teaching, I have taken his results and rearranged them according to the definitions assigned to those various notes by each theologian. The result is the following list. A. Revealed doctrines which must be held by faith. 1. A revealed doctrine of faith which has been defined as such by the Church, designated Fide Veritas by Cano, eventually De Fidei, and Dogma became standard terminology. A. An assertion that contradicts such a doctrine, designated Eretica by Antonius, Piraeus, Castro, and all subsequent authorities. B. An assertion that contradicts such a doctrine, according to almost all theologians, designated Third Grade Error, Cano Bagnez, Error, Lorca. 2. A revealed doctrine of faith, per all fathers and theologians, but not yet defined as such by the Church. A. An assertion that contradicts such a doctrine, designated Eretica Definibilis, or Eretica Non Authentice, Pan Ormo, Eresi Proxima, Montaigne, Gautier, Groot. 3. A revealed doctrine of faith according to almost all theologians, designated Fidei Proxima, Panormo, and all subsequent authorities. A. An assertion that contradicts such a doctrine, designated Second Grade Error, Cano, Bagnez, Error, Lorca, Gotti, Erese Proxima, Panormo, Montaigne, Gautier. 4. A revealed doctrine of faith, according to most theologians, designated Fere de Fide, or Proxima de Fide, Lugo. A. An assertion that contradicts such a doctrine, designated Fere Eresis, or Proxima Eresis, Lugo. Probabilita Hereticus, Panormo. Eresi Proxima, Tornley, Kilber. But other theologians argue that such an assertion cannot be censured, since there is insufficient certainty that it is false. 5. A doctrine that is revealed, but which was not fully clear until it was defined and clarified by the Church. Designated Conclusio Theologica, Cano. 
although he says this term is used here in an improper sense. The Carmelites of Salamanca rejected this term for this category. B. Deductions. 1. A proposition deduced from two premises that are de fide and which has been defined by the Church. Designated conclusio theologica and proxima ad certitudinem fidei, Lorca. However, Suarez, Lugo, and Panormo consider such propositions to be simply a dogma of faith. A. An assertion that contradicts such a doctrine. Designated erese proxima, Lorca. However, Cano, Bañez, Suarez, Lugo, and Panormo consider such an assertion to be simply heresy. 2. A proposition deduced from two premises that are de fide, but which has not been defined. Designated conclusio per parare theologiae and a truth of faith which is mediately revealed. Cano. Conclusio theologica and proxima ad certitudinem fide. Lorca. However, Suarez, Lugo, and the Carmelites of Salamanca consider such a proposition to be simply a dogma of faith. A. An assertion that contradicts such a doctrine. Designated error, Bañez. Erese proxima, Lorca. However, Suarez, Lugo, and the Carmelites of Salamanca consider such an assertion to be simply heresy. 3. A proposition deduced from one premise de fide and one premise known by natural reason and which has been defined by the Church. Designated conclusio theologica and proxima ad certitudinem fidei, Lorca, but considered simply a dogma of faith by Suarez and Lugo. On the other hand, the Carmelites of Salamanca and Panormo hold that such a proposition cannot be defined by the Church. A. An assertion that contradicts such a doctrine. Designated Eresim Sapiens, Tokamata. Eresim Manifestum Sapiens, Simancus. Herese Proxima, Lorca and considered simply heresy by Cano, Bañez, Suarez, and the Carmelites of Salamanca. 4. A proposition deduced from one premise de fide and one premise known by natural reason, but which has not been defined. Suarez gives the following example. Christ is capable of laughter. This follows from Christ is truly human, de fide, and all humans are capable of laughter known by natural reason. Designated conclusio theologica and proxima ad certitudinem fide, Lorca, conclusie propriare theologiae, and a truth of faith which is mediately revealed, cano. Conclusio theologica, Suarez, Lugo, and the Carmelites of Salamanca, Panormo, Montaigne, Gautier, Mazella, Groot, and all subsequent authorities. A. An assertion that contradicts such a doctrine. Designated Eresim Sapiens, Tercamata. Eresim Manifestum Sapiens, Simacas. Erese Proxima, Lorca. Error, Bañez, Suarez, Lugo, Lorena, the Carmelites of Salamanca, Panormo, Gotti, Montaigne, Gautier, Sheban, Mazella, Groot, Below, Garagou Lagrange, and all subsequent authorities. B. An assertion that contradicts such a doctrine, according to almost all theologians, designated Eresum Sapiens, Suarez. 5. A proposition deduced from one premise de fide and one premise known by natural reason, according to almost all theologians, but which has not been defined, designated Conclusio Theologica, Panormo. A. An assertion which contradicts such a doctrine, designated Eresum Sapiens, Suarez, Viva. Error. Error, unium, errori proxima, panormo. 6. A proposition deduced from one premise, de fide, and one premise known by natural reason, according to most theologians, but which has not been defined. A. An assertion that contradicts such a doctrine. Designated errori proxima, lugo kilber, probabilita errone, panorma. But other theologians argue that such an assertion cannot be censured, since there is insufficient certainty that it is false. C. A doctrine which is universally believed, which is not revealed, and yet is connected to faith in such a way that if it were denied, the result would not contradict the faith, but would so-called weaken the faith in some manner. Kano gives the following example. Special prayers, which are applied to one person by religious or by prelates, are more beneficial to that person than general prayers. Designated 
Appendix Fidei, Doctrina Christiana, and Doctrina Catholica, Cano, Bañez, and Doctrina Catholica, Lugo. This category was invented by Cano but was abandoned by the late 17th century as subsequent theologians found his description unclear. 1. An assertion that contradicts such a doctrine. Designated first grade error, Cano, Bañez. D. An assertion made without sufficient arguments from authority or reason. Cartagini gives the following example. In addition to the Blessed Virgin, there is another saint who was conceived without original sin. Designated to Maria consistently throughout this era. Each of the notes in the preceding list indicates something about the meaning of a proposition. There are also a number of notes that indicate something about the phrasing of a proposition. Cahill has included these in his study as well. Again, reorganizing his survey by content rather than by the name of each note, the following list is obtained. A. There is some ambiguity about the meaning of the proposition. 1. The proposition's sole propter, non-metaphorical meaning, is heretical, but it also has a metaphorical meaning which is orthodox. Suarez gives the example, Christ sins every day, which is true only in the sense that the church is metaphorically identified with Christ. Suarez states that such propositions should be condemned according to their non-metaphorical meaning. 2. The proposition has a definite heretical flavor, however it is not manifestly heretical and perhaps it might sometimes, under some circumstances, have a pious and Catholic sense. Nonetheless, a judgment based on the actual circumstances of its enunciation indicates that the speaker probably intended the heretical meaning. The Carmelites of Salamanca give the following example. Faith justifies. Although this proposition was once harmless, since the rise of Lutheranism, it cannot be stated without qualification, since it is liable to be misunderstood. Designated male sonans and pirarum ariarum offensiva, Turcomata, eresim sapiens, banyes, Lorca, lugo, fere, the Carmelites of Salamanca, Gatti, Tornley, Groot, and all subsequent authorities. A. The same, except its flavor is merely erroneous, as defined above, not heretical. Designated Errorum Sapiens, Lugo. 3. The proposition is a definite heretical flavor. However, it is not manifestly heretical, and perhaps it might sometimes, under some circumstances, have a pious and Catholic sense. Moreover, a judgment based on the actual circumstances of its enunciation does not indicate that the speaker probably intended the heretical meaning. Designated de erese suspecta, Lugo, Ferre, the Carmelites of Salamanca, Gotti, Tornley, Groot, and all subsequent authorities. A. The same, except its flavor, is merely erroneous, as defined above, not heretical. Designated de errore suspecta, Lugo. 4. The proposition's proper, non-metaphorical, and prima facie meaning is heretical, but an alternative proper interpretation that is always available is pious. Designated Eresim Sapiens and Male Sonans, Castro Simancus. Cano rejected this category. 5. The proposition is equivocal, having two proper, non-metaphorical meanings, one of which is heretical and one of which is pious. Given the circumstances, it seems more likely that the speaker intended the heretical meaning. Designated Eresim Sapiens and De Erese Suspecta, Larina Panormo, Eresim Sapiens, Montaigne, Gautier, Mazella. A. The same, except the bad meaning deserves a censure less than heretica or concerns an action rather than a belief. Designated Malesonans and Pirara Marorum Offensiva, Panormo, Montaigne. 6. The proposition is equivocal, having two proper non-metaphorical meanings, one of which is heretical and one of which is pious. The circumstances do not indicate which meaning was intended by the speaker. Designated male sonans, Suarez, eresim sapiens, and de erese suspecta, Lorina, de erese suspecta, Mazella. B. The meaning of the proposition is not necessarily false or unorthodox, and the speaker intended no evil. However... The words are used in an incongruous and unusual manner. Lugo gives the following example. In God, there are three relative essences. The speaker probably intends an orthodox meaning, but as traditional language uses 
hypostasis or persons for the three and essence or being for the one, this phrasing will cause confusion. Designated males sonans, Lugo, the Carmelites of Salamanca, Gatti, Gautier, and all subsequent authorities. C. The meaning of the proposition is not necessarily false or unorthodox. The speaker intended no evil, and the words are intended in their traditional signification. However, the phrasing is shocking or expresses something that is best left unsaid. Lugo gives the following example. Matthew, a greedy usurer, pray for us. Peter, perjurer and apostate, pray for us. Designated male sonans and pirarum ororum offensiva, cano banyes lorca, pirarum ororum offensiva, suarez, hortaldo, lugo, the Carmelites of Salamanca, Gratier, Franzlein, Mazella, Groot, Pesch, Schultes, and all subsequent authorities. Finally, in addition to notes and censures describing the meaning of a proposition and those describing the phrasing of a proposition, there are also censures describing the possible effects a proposition may have on its hearers. Scandalous, dangerous to morals, subversive of the hierarchy, etc. These need not concern us here. As can be seen from the lists above, when all the definitions assigned to theological notes by theologians from the 15th to 20th centuries are listed alongside each other, the result includes dozens of different ways that a proposition can be related to Catholic truths. Yet, a careful reading of the lists above reveals that not a single one of these notes has anything to do with non-definitive papal or conciliar teaching. The definition of a doctrine by the Church is reflected in several of these notes, but no other level of teaching is mentioned. Indeed, it is clear that most of these notes indicate something about the views of theologians rather than the views expressed in official Church documents. In other words, theologians during this era treated every simple declarative statement regarding, a matter, regarding matters of faith made by a general council as having equal weight. Thus, when Lateran V declared that the rational soul is immortal, and when Trent condemned the claim that only mortal sin is unbelief, these statements were given equal weight according to the system of theological notes. Similarly, two simple declarative statements about faith made by popes were given equal weight to each other, although there was still great disagreement about the weight of conciliar teachings vis-a-vis -vis papal teachings. However, this does not mean that there was no way for a pope or a council to teach a doctrine at a lower level of authority. By attaching a note or censure to a statement, a pope or council could indicate that it was not choosing to definitively settle an issue. For example, when Pope John XXII condemned 26 statements associated with Meister Eckhart in 1329, he condemned 15 of them as heretical, thus indicating that their exact contradictories were de fide, but he condemned the other eleven merely as male sonare, evil-sounding, temerius, rash, and de erese suspectos, suspect of heresy. And when Pius VI condemned eighty-five teachings of the Synod of Pistonia in 1794, each of them was given a specific censure. Thus, the statement that the body of Christ includes only those Christians who are perfect worshippers was condemned as heresy, while the statement that faith is the very first grace given by God and is preceded by no other grace was condemned as de erese suspecta, eresim sapiens, having the flavor of heresy, and erroneo. Occasionally a pope or council might invoke a very low degree of certainty, as when the Council of Vienna, after considering two different descriptions of the effect of baptism on infants, decreed one opinion to be more probable and more in harmony with the words of the saints and of modern doctors of theology. When a pope or council's decree explicitly stated the note or censure, its weight was easy to determine. Moreover, as was shown in the previous section, it was universally accepted that papal and conciliar teachings on disciplinary matters had to be treated differently from teachings on matters of faith, and also that a pope could teach as a private doctor if he so choose, and such teaching held no official authority at all. But what of papal or conciliar teachings regarding faith that did not include a theological note? There was still no answer to this question. 
Cahill's detailed study ends with the work of Antonio de Panormo. Cahill's detailed study ends with the work of Antonio de Panormo in 1709. In the ensuing two centuries, the meaning of these notes would not change. Thus, the article on theological notes in the 1923 Dictionnaire de Theologie Catholique adds nothing to Panormo's work. In the middle of the 20th century, new notes would be added, as will be described in a subsequent section. The Post-Tridentine Era In the two centuries following the Council of Trent, the theology of the Magisterium developed in several ways. As we have seen in the Middle Ages, it was generally accepted that all the doctrinal teachings of general councils were infallibly taught to be held by the faithful as being of faith, de fide, unless they were explicitly labeled otherwise. Of course, this applied only to teachings on matters of fides et mores, since the Church's infallibility was understood to include only such matters. The structure of the Tridentine documents suggested other possible analyses. Most of these documents included a series of so-called chapters containing doctrinal exposition and declarations, followed by a series of short so-called canons anathematizing anyone who would, obstinately, hold certain assertions that contradicted the content of the chapters. But since the chapters were often much longer than the canons, not every positive assertion in the chapters corresponded to a condemnation in a canon. Why had the Council Fathers attached anatima sit only to certain false claims? Some theologians concluded that Catholics must hold de fide, that the views condemned in the canons were false, but the chapters themselves did not teach anything binding in faith. Others argued that in addition to the canons being de fide, any doctrine that was presented in the form of a definition was de fide, even if it was located in a chapter. But the other material contained in the chapter, the obiter dicta, was not de fide. This question continued to be debated for several centuries. Another development was the introduction of the so-called secondary object of infallibility. Up to this point, infallibility had been applied only to the teachings of revealed truths entrusted to the Church as part of the deposit of the faith. In 1653, Innocent X issued the bull Cum Occasione, condemning five propositions summarized from Cornelius Jansen's Augustinus as heretical. Antonin Arnold, a leader of the Jansenists, denied that these five propositions were accurate summaries of Jansen's teachings. A pope could condemn these ideas, he argued, but could not condemn the book itself. The next pope, Alexander VII, replied by declaring and defining that these propositions were indeed faithful to the meaning of Jansen's book. This began a long argument about whether the Church's infallibility extended not only to revealed truths, the primary object of infallibility, but also to certain non-revealed truths, the secondary object. Since the goal of this dissertation is to focus on non-infallible authoritative teaching, this debate will not be further explored here. The third important development was the politicization of the debate over papal infallibility. In 1682, the Assembly of the Clergy of France, convoked by King Louis XIV himself, promulgated the four Gallican Articles. The fourth of these articles stated that although the Pope did play a principal role in defining doctrines, his definitions were irreformable, quote, only when they have received the consent of the Church, end quote. During the following century, many theologians took the Gallican position, including Bossuet, Tornley, Bailey, Berger, and La Lorraine. Others argued in favor of papal infallibility, including Orsi, Ligori, Zaccaria, Balernii, and Muzarellii. It was hardly a coincidence that the former were usually French and the latter were usually Italian. Only in the aftermath of the French Revolution did the infallibist position become more popular among Catholics in France. A dissertation by Michael D. Place surveys what the proponents of papal infallibility in this era wrote regarding the Pope's authoritative but non-infallible teaching. Place studies the writings of four figures. St. Alphonsus de Ligori, died 1787, 
Francesco Antonio Zaccaria died 1795, Pietro Ballerini died 1796, and Mauro Capelleri, later Pope Gregory XVI, died 1846. Two of these theologians, Ligori and Caparari, say nothing at all about this question, apparently assuming that anything a pope teaches about fides et mores, except in his captivity as a private doctor, is infallible. Ballerini's treatment of papal infallibility is quite nuanced and includes a description of the kind of papal teachings which are not infallible. In addition to disciplinary decrees and the teachings of a pope as a private doctor, Ballerini also considers as outside the scope of infallibility papal judgments regarding specific persons, as well as papal statements that a certain theological opinion is probable, safer than another, or morally certain. Even in situations where a matter is definable, a pope may choose to issue a non-definitive yet authoritative teaching on that matter, not invoking his full so-called ex cathedra apostolic authority. He offers the case of Pope Honorius as an example. Honorius's letter in AD 634 to Sergius, Patriarch of Constantinople, spoke favorably of monothelitism, for which he was posthumously condemned by the Third Council of Constantinople. AD 680 to 81, and by his own successors in the papacy. Ballerini rejects the claim by some of his contemporaries that Honorius was speaking as a private doctor, as it would be absurd to suppose that a letter from a pope to a patriarch about a current controversy would not be an official statement. Moreover, the matter in question clearly falls within the scope of faith, since it was subsequently defined by Nicaea II. Therefore, he argues, it must be recognized that Honorius' letter was an authoritative teaching. Yet it was not infallible, as Honorius did not claim to be settling the question definitively. However, while Bellarini makes it clear that there is non-infallible authoritative level of teaching, he does not indicate what kind of response the Catholic faithful owe to such teaching. Place hypothesizes that Bellarini might have seen it as comparable to the response owed to papal legislation, assent being the default position, but if grave reasons were found which oppose the teaching, Catholics may withhold internal assent as long as they do not question the legislator's authority in general. He admits, however, that this is an extrapolation beyond what Bellarini actually states. Zachariah, too, recognizes that popes can teach non-definitively. Like Ballerini, he fails to specify the obligation that the faithful have to such teaching. One final development in this era must be noted. As described in the previous section, it was recognized that a pope or council could choose to teach at a lower level of authority by attaching a theological note to a specific assertion. For example... The Synod of Pistoia, 1786, taught that the Church should return to the ancient custom of having only one altar in each physical church. Auctorum Fidei, Pope Pius VI's response to this Synod, condemns this teaching as rash to Maria and injurious to the very ancient pious custom flourishing and approved for these many centuries in the Church, especially in the Latin Church. Therefore, if a Catholic were to ask what to make of the following statement, A. We should return to the ancient custom of having only one altar in each physical church, the reply of Pius VI was that this statement was tamaria. In other words, there are not enough strong arguments in its favor to justify rejecting the weight of recent tradition. But suppose a Catholic were to ask what to make of the following statement, B. The proposition... We should return to the ancient custom of having only one altar on e in B. The proposition, we should return to the ancient custom of having only one altar in each physical church, is rash. According to some theologians of this era, including Ligori, even though statement A was condemned at a relatively low level, statement B has been taught infallibly. In other words, a Catholic cannot know with the certainty of faith that statement A is false, but he or she can know with the certainty of faith that statement A is rash.
This seems an odd combination. If it is not certain that A is false, then it might possibly be true. But if it were true, and someone were to prove that fact, how could it be rash for them to demonstrate their proof? Or does Ligori's position merely mean that one must hold that this statement was unsubstantiated with arguments in the time of Pius VI, even though better arguments might subsequently be found? Despite such logical problems, the idea that the minor censures could be taught infallibly would remain common until the mid-20th century. Pius IX and the First Vatican Council In the 19th century, several developments occurred which tended to centralize Catholic theology in Rome. In 1824, the restored Jesuit order was given charge of the Roman College, later the Gregorian University. With the growth of secular regimes in Europe, the Roman College became viewed as the most reliable source of Catholic doctrine. Seven of the eight popes who reigned in the century between 1878 and 1978 had Gregorian educations, and in 1969, 230 out of approximately 280 bishops in the United States had Gregorian educations. Many papal and conciliar documents from 1824 to 1962 were prepared by theologians from this school. It was also during this era that popes began to issue encyclicals freely. A significant portion of the teachings in these encyclicals dealt with matters of faith and morals, and yet were neither phrased in the form of definitions nor assigned specific theological notes. It was thus impossible for theologians to ignore the importance of non-definitive authoritative papal teaching, as many had done in the past. Tuas Lebenter Pope Pius IX's letter, Tuas Lebenter, was the first official church document to refer explicitly to the existence of non-definitive authoritative teaching. It was also the first such document to state that dogmas could be established by the bishops even when dispersed throughout the world. And it was also the first such document to use the term ordinary magisterium, which, unfortunately, would soon be used to refer to both of the aforementioned kinds of teaching. This letter was sent by Pius IX in 1863 to Munich's Archbishop Gregor von Scheer in reference to a congress of Catholic theologians held in that city. The Pope began by commending the theologians for professing their loyalty to all dogmas infallibly defined by popes and ecumenical councils. However, he continued, the assent of divine faith should be given not only to these dogmas, but must also be extended to those matters transmitted as divinely revealed by the ordinary magisterium of the whole church dispersed throughout the world, and for that reason, held by the universal and constant consensus of Catholic theologians as belonging to the faith. The subsequent theology of the infallibility of the dispersed bishops, retitled the Ordinary and Universal Magisterium at Vatican I, will not be explored here. After stressing the importance of accepting infallibly taught doctrines, Pius IX reminded the theologians meeting in Munich the following. That it, not, that it is not sufficient for learned Catholics to accept and revere the aforesaid dogmas of the Church, but that it is also necessary to subject themselves, say, subicant, to the decisions pertaining to doctrine that are issued by the pontifical congregations, and also to those points of doctrine that are held by the common and constant consensus of Catholics as theological truths and conclusions, theologice veritates et conclusiones, so certain that opinions opposed to these same forms of doctrine although they cannot be called heretical, nevertheless deserve some other theological censure. 
The Pope's reference to theological truths and conclusions certainly includes propositions logically deduced from dogmas and naturally known truths, as described in the earlier section on theological notes, although it is not clear if all the minor censures are being included in this statement. First Vatican Council The documents of Vatican I contain only a brief reference to the obligation owed by the Catholic faithful to non-definitive teaching. It appears at the very end of the dogmatic constitution of the Catholic faith, Dei Filius. But since it is not enough to avoid the contamination of heresy unless those errors are carefully shunned which approach it in greater or less degree, we warn all of their duty to observe the constitutions and decrees in which such wrong opinions, though not expressly mentioned in this document, have been banned and forbidden by this holy see. Although the Council's other constitution, Pastor Eternus, discusses the Pope's infallible magisterium, it does not deal with his non-infallible magisterium, except insofar as, by specifying the conditions for the exercise of infallibility, it implies that teachings which failed to meet these conditions were not infallible. These conditions were explained in great detail by Bishop Vincenzens Gasser, spokesman for the deputation De Fide, in his four-hour relatio of July 11, 1870. Gassier made several points that are of interest here. First, he criticized the extreme papalist position that made the Pope the sole holder of the Church's infallibility, thereby viewing all other infallibility, including that of an ecumenical council as delegated by the Pope, a position which, I am sorry to say, has been expressed by several bishops during the council. Gasser said this position was invalid because the Pope's own power of infallibility can never be delegated. Rather, there are two distinct subjects that exercise the power of infallibility, the Pope and the entire body of the bishops. Although distinct, these two subjects are not separate because an ecumenical council cannot act without the Pope. Although he did not point this out, the non-delegatability of this charism also means that no Roman congregation can issue infallible decrees. Second, he made it clear that the extent of the Pope's infallibility and the extent of a council's infallibility were identical. He explained that if a complete constitution of the Church had been written, the deputation had planned on discussing the extent of the secondary object of infallibility, but having abandoned the longer project, the deputation had decided that the schema would merely state that the Pope, in his ex cathedra definitions, possesses the same infallibility that Christ gave to the Church. In other words, the infallibility of the Pope is neither more nor less extensive than the infallibility of the Church in her definitions of doctrine of faith and morals. Although Gasser was referring only to infallibility, this principle has continued to inform theologians. For example, as will be seen in chapter 3, Francis Sullivan uses this principle to argue that the full range of authoritative weights are equally possible for papal and conciliar teachings, and there is no a priori reason to hold a conciliar text above a papal text or vice versa. Some bishops had proposed amending the text of Pastor Eternus to state that a pope, when issuing an infallible definition, must use a specific verbal formula. Gasser rejected this suggestion by pointing out that such a condition made no sense because the Vatican Council's intention was not merely to state that popes henceforth would have the authority to teach infallibly. Rather, as most theologians already recognized, definitions issued by popes had always been infallible provided that certain conditions were satisfied. The task of the Council was to specify what these conditions were. Indeed, Gasser pointed out, Popes had been teaching infallibility for centuries. We are not dealing with something new here. Already thousands and thousands of dogmatic judgments have gone forth from the apostolic see. Finally, he stated that the very reason for the existence of the church's charism of teaching was to fulfill Christ's command to shepherd the faithful. Therefore, a charism of infallibility would be useless if the faithful were unable to determine which teachings had been infallibly taught. Gasser made this point in the context of explaining why, 
Even though a pope was morally obligated to properly research a question and to consult with the authoritative experts before issuing a definition, such preparation was not specified as a condition for a definition. If this were stated as a condition, the infallibility of a teaching could never be verified by the faithful, who would have no way of knowing exactly how much the pope had prepared. From a pope's point of view, a definition required serious preparation. From the public's point of view, if a pope did indeed issue a definition, it could be relied on regardless of what was publicly known regarding his preparation. There was no contradiction between these two points of view, for if a pope were to fail to adequately prepare or otherwise intend to issue a definition that was erroneous and destructive of the church, Christ's promise would guarantee that the pope would be impeded in his attempt. I would argue that Gesser's axiom should be taken as foundational for any theology of the magisterium. Any theology which admits that there are different levels of church teaching authority, while describing them in such a way that the faithful are unable to determine the authority of any specific teaching, has no practical value. There is one more question that Gesser addressed but in such a way that his opinion is difficult to determine. In his Relatio of July 11, Gasser stated that infallibility was active only when the Pope was definitively settling a question by putting an end to a doubt about a certain doctrine or proposing that doctrine as one which must be held by the universal church. Indeed, this finality was the property and note of a definition, properly so called. In the days following his presentation, however, Several bishops expressed their unhappiness with this assertion. What about the lesser censures, such as proximate to heresy, offensive to pious ears, and so on? Gasser had apparently ruled out the possibility that these minor censures could be infallibly taught. In response to their complaints, Gasser took the podium one more time on July 16th and announced that the deputation de fide wanted him to clarify this point. According to the deputation, the word define in pastor eternus extended even to minor censures. For example, the Pope could infallibly define a certain thesis to be proximate to heresy. Although the Pope would not be anathematizing this thesis, nor defining that its opposite was true, he would be infallibly defining that this thesis was in fact proximate to heresy. Did Gesser really misspeak on July 11th, or had he altered his stated position on this question under pressure? Lacking any private diaries from the members of the deputation, there is no way to know. Gesser's revised comments allowed for the lesser censures to be taught infallibly, but it is difficult to read such a claim into the actual text of Pastor Eternus. The Manualist Era the earliest theological so-called manuals were collections of moral guidelines intended for confessors. Eventually, the manualist tradition expanded beyond moral casuistry and began to encompass all branches of systematic theology. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, these manuals, often written by Jesuits at the Gregorian, were used in seminaries throughout the Catholic world. T. Hallen Sanks has argued that although these professors hailed from different countries, they were less shaped by the cultures of their native lands than they were by the culture of the Romanitas that permeated Papal Rome and then Vatican City. Josef Komenchak has called the seminary manuals a distinct genus literarium. In contrast to medieval theology, which was characterized by the questio, in which a question is set forth, arguments on both sides are considered, and then a verdict is rendered. Manualistic theology was characterized by the thesis. The author begins by stating a Catholic doctrine, and then so-called demonstrates the truth of this doctrine by adducing proof from magisterial documents, popes, ecumenical councils, and local councils, scripture, the church fathers, and arguments from reason. The early manuals are not wedded to a single philosophical outlook, but after Pope Leo XIII issued Eterni Patris, 1879, and made sure Thomists were appointed to the philosophy and theology faculty at the Gregorian in the six years following that encyclical, the manuals were constantly written from a neo-scholastic perspective. Generally speaking, 
These manuals discussed the theology of the magisterium within the treatise De Ecclesia, which was part of fundamental theology. Some of the most important manualists will be considered in this section. Johann Baptist Franzelein Johann Baptist Franzelein, Society of Jesus, was born in Aldian, Tyrol, in 1816. From 1850 until his death, he taught at the Gregorian, except for the four years that he served as prefect of the German College in Rome. He was the primary teacher of ecclesiology at the Gregorian from 1858 to 1876. He composed the first draft of De Filius for the Vatican Council and was created a cardinal in 1876. His manual, Tractatus de Divina Tradizione et Scriptura, was published in 1870, shortly after Vatican I, and went through at least four editions. He died in 1886. Much of Franzelein's treatment of the magisterium is taken from early authorities. His use of theological notes conforms to the usage described earlier in this chapter. He explains the difference between a pope's official teaching and his teaching as a private doctor. Like Ligori, he asserts that even the lesser censures can be taught infallibly. He then goes further. He states that even a so-called global censure can be infallible, mentioning the bull Unigenitus as a specific example. In this 1713 document, Clement XI condemned 101 propositions taken from the writings of Pachier Quisnel, a Jansenist theologian. But instead of attaching a censure to each of these propositions, Clement simply listed them all and then concluded with the following global censure. We declare, condemn, and reprove the previously listed propositions as false, capacious, evil-sounding, offensive to pious ears, scandalous, pernicious, rash, harmful to the church and to her practice, insulting not only to the church, but also to the secular powers, seditious, impious, blasphemous, suspected of heresy, and smacking of heresy itself, and indeed favorable towards heretics and heresies and schisms, erroneous, close to heresy, many times condemned, and finally heretical, and manifestly renewing various heresies, chiefly those in the famous propositions of Jansen, and indeed held in the sense in which they have been condemned respectively. The reader is left without any indication as to which of these propositions are merely offensive to pious ears and which are heretical. Another famous global censure appears in Leo X's bull, Exerge Domine, which condemns 41 errors of Martin Luther without specifying which censure applies to which error. When Franzelein and many manuals after him claim that a global censure of this kind is infallible, they were apparently asserting that Catholics much, must believe that each of the condemned propositions is deserving of at least one of the censures listed, without any way of knowing which censures apply to any given proposition. Franzelein does limit the scope of infallibility, even in dogmatic definitions, by insisting that when a pope or council issues such a definition, only the doctrine explicitly being defined is being taught infallibly. The other material in such a document, including the arguments presented to support the conclusion as well as the orbiter dicta, is not taught infallibly. Although one may hold these passages have weighty authority, they are not infallible definitions. Moreover, a pope is free at any time to issue doctrinal opinions at lower levels of authority without teaching infallibly. It is interesting that while Franzelein makes this statement with regard to popes, he does not seem to consider the possibility that an ecumenical council might do so as well. In the subsequent paragraph, when discussing the process of determining whether a pope or council has taught infallibly, he points to the bull of union with the Arminians, issued at the Council of Florence in 1439, explaining that it is difficult to determine whether the teachings which are found here, namely the teachings concerning the manner and form of the sacraments, are dogmatic definitions or merely instructions to be observed in practice. Franzlein mentions only two alternatives, infallibly taught doctrine and disciplinary instructions, without considering that this council might have issued non-definitive doctrinal teachings. Franzelein describes the assent owed by the Catholic faithful to authoritative, non-definitive papal teaching. He says that, while such Catholic doctrines, doctrina catholicae, do not possess infallible truth, veritas infallibilis, they nonetheless possess infallible security, 
infallibilis securitas. In other words, while Catholics cannot be absolutely certain that such teachings are true, they can be absolutely certain that accepting such teachings as true on the authority of the Church will not imperil their souls. It is worth noting that Franzlein routinely italicizes all technical terms he introduces, but Doctrine Catholicae is not italicized. It would seem, therefore, that he is using this term not as a special designation for the category of non-infallible authoritative teachings, but as a general term whose meaning is made specific only in the context of his text. Nonetheless, this term would soon be added to the ranks of theological notes to designate this category, possibly because of Franzlein's use of it here. Finally, Franzlein evaluates the authority of doctrinal teachings of the Roman congregations. He says these can never be infallible, since the Pope cannot delegate his charism of infallibility to another. The Holy Spirit does protect the teachings of these congregations, but such protection guarantees only their safety, not their truth. In other words, it is possible that the teaching of a Roman congregation could be false, but it is not possible that the Catholic faithful could endanger their souls as a result of trusting such teaching. Catholics owe internal assent to the safety of such teachings. Mere reverential silence is not generally sufficient. Christian Pesch Christian Pesch, Society of Jesus, was born near Cologne in 1835. In 1884, he began teaching theology at Ditton Hall, a scholasticate in Liverpool that had been established by Jesuits who had left Germany during the Kulturkampf. In 1895, the scholasticate and Pesch relocated to Falkenberg, Holland. Pesch's greatest work was a nine-volume manual of theology, the Pretilectionis Dogmatiche, which would still be used in seminaries as late as the 1950s. He later wrote a four-volume abridgment of this work, Compendium Theologicae Dogmaticae. Pesch taught at Falkenberg until 1912 and died in 1925. The second part of the first volume of the Predilecciones, entitled De Ecclesia Christi, begins with a discussion of the teaching authority of the Church. Pesch investigates the foundations of the teaching authority and the use of infallibility in detail. He indicates that it is often difficult to determine whether any given doctrine was actually taught infallibly. He addresses the case of the syllabus of errors, citing nine theologians who expressed opinions about its infallibility. Some said yes, others said no, and others said it was infallible only in parts. Pesch made no attempt to resolve their differences, nor does he offer an opinion of his own. Unlike Franzlein, Pesch does not consider the minor censures to be infallible, as they often deal with matters that vary in time or place. For example, if one states in Latin that the Father is the cause of the Son, this would rightly be censured as evil-sounding, but it is not evil-sounding in Greek, for the Greek word for cause is more broad than the Latin causa, and thus the Greek statement has an orthodox interpretation. Pesch has an interesting view of the authority of the Roman congregations. Since congregations do not teach infallibly, one must, quote, inquire into the reasons, end quote, for any doctrines they teach. For in this way, it will happen that either the proposed doctrine shall be gradually received by the church and thus be elevated to the status of infallibility, or else will gradually be detected. It seemed, this seems to suggest that no doctrine will remain authoritative but non-definitive forever. Ultimately, it will either be revoked or be taught definitively. Louis Below. Louis Below, Society of Jesus, was born in 1846 in Chirac, France. In 1885, he was awarded the Chair of Dogmatic Theology at the Roman College, completing the Thomistic reorientation of the school desired by Pope Leo XIII. Gerald McCool calls Below the first of the great Thomistic speculative theologians, stating that the influence which Below exerted on Catholic theology throughout his published works and through the presence of his former students in seminaries and scholasticates throughout the world was enormous. Below taught at the Gregorian until 1910, when he became a consultor to the Holy Office, and the next year he was made a cardinal. A staunch French monarchist and nationalist, he was unhappy when Pius XI condemned Action Francais in 1926, and at which time he renounced the Cardinalate after a private meeting with the Pope. He died in 1931. In many ways, 
Below's theology represents the height of ultramontanism. He considers the bishops, even in council, to exercise no teaching authority other than that which is delegated them by the Pope. In fact, the only reason a council is preferable to the Pope acting alone is that people are impressed by its solemnity and by the perfect unanimity between the bishops and the Pope. On the last page of his manual, he states that while the bishops are pastors and teachers with respect to the people, they are sheep and disciples with respect to the pontiff. Billet distinguishes three modes of papal teaching. First, as private doctor. Second, in his role as pontiff, but without exercising the fullness of his apostolic power. And third, by issuing an ex cathedra definition. The second category includes many things in recent papal encyclicals, as well as doctrinal decisions of the Roman congregations which have been approved by the Pope. So far, it would seem that Below's second category represents authoritative but non-definitive papal teaching. But then Below offers a surprising twist. When a pope, in an encyclical or similar document, directly proposes a certain doctrine, it is not an ex cathedra statement as described by the Vatican Council, and yet it cannot be doubted that in documents of this type addressed to the universal church, the pontiffs are infallible. This view raises nearly every papal teaching to the level of infallibility. Given this expansive view, it is hardly surprising that Below also extends infallibility to the minor censures, proximate to heresy, evil-sounding, scandalous, tending towards sedition and offensive to pious ears, even when issued in the form of a global censure. Below justifies this claim by pointing out that popes and councils have issued these censures in solemn documents. Below ranks the documents of the Roman congregation lower than papal documents. The Roman congregations of his era often declared it so-called safe, tuta, or unsafe, for a certain doctrine to be taught to the faithful. Below asserts that such declarations do not apply directly to the doctrine itself, but are relative to a particular situation, and can change if new and better arguments are found. Therefore, if a congregation alters its position regarding some doctrine, this should not be considered a, quote, revision, reformatio, of the earlier statement, as there is no contradiction between a doctrine being safe to teach at one time and unsafe at another. Below cites the condemnation of the Copernican system as so-called unsafe in the time of Galileo as an example. Ludwig Lerker and Florian Schlagenaufen. Ludwig Lerker, Society of Jesus, was born in 1864 in Hall, Austria. He became a professor of theology at the University of Innsbruck in 1899 and died in 1937. The second book of Lerker's multi-volume manual, De Ecclesia Christi, discusses the teaching authority of the Pope. Lerker, following the 1917 Code of Canon Law, asserts that no papal teaching should be held as definitive unless this fact is manifestly established. All other papal teachings are taught with less than the pontiff's maximum authority. These include not only the writings of the popes themselves, such as encyclicals, but also documents of Roman congregations approved by a pope. Catholics owe a certain kind of assent to these non-definitive teachings, not merely so-called reverential silence, silentium obesquium vel reverentiale, but internal religious assent, ascensus internos religiosus. Yet the possibility of error in these teachings, although unlikely, does exist. When there are grave reasons for doubting the truth of such a teaching, one may suspend, contact the Holy See to inform them of the problem, and maintain reverential silence until the Holy See resolves the issue. After Lerker's death, his manual was updated by Florian Schlagenhaufen, Society of Jesus, who edited the 3rd, 4th, and 5th editions. Schlagenaufen was born in 1892 in Hasselbach, Styria, Austria, taught at the University of Innsbruck from 1928 to 1957, except during the war, and died in 1969. Schlagenaufen preserves all the details of Lerker's treatment described above. He also expanded the treatment of what would happen if the Pope were to issue a false teaching thus. 
If the Roman pontiff authoritatively, but not with the highest authority, obliges all, be faithful, to assent to a matter as true, either revealed truth or truth connected to revelation, it does not seem that he is infallible de jure. Neither is it necessary to say that the Holy Spirit would never permit the pontiff to promulgate such an erroneous decree. Certainly, the Holy Spirit will never permit the Church to be led into error by such a decree. The means by which such an error will be rejected is probably this. The assistance of the Holy Spirit will be given to the head of the Church by which such an erroneous decree will be prevented. However, it cannot be absolutely ruled out that the error would be removed by the Holy Spirit in this manner. The Pope's subjects would discover the error and cease to internally assent to the decree. Along these same lines, Schlagenaufen states that if a Roman congregation were to issue an erroneous teaching, the Holy Spirit would prevent the entire church from being led into error, probably by leading the bishops and the faithful to withhold their internal assent. Of all the manualists, Schlagenaufen goes into the most detail about the possibility of error in a non-definitive papal pronouncement. Your Queen Salaveri. Your Queen Salaveri de la Torre, Society of Jesus, was born in 1892 in Mondoñedo, Spain. He entered the Society of Jesus in 1910, receiving his theological training at Falkenberg at the Gregorian. He taught at the Comilius Pontifical University from 1929 to 1932, at the Gregorian in the 1930s, and then again at Comilios from 1940 until his retirement in 1972. He served as the Peritus for the Spanish bishops at Vatican II and died in 1979. Salaveri contributed the treatise De Ecclesia Christi to the four-volume Sacre Theologiae Summa written by the Spanish Jesuits. Richard McBrien has written that nowhere is the traditional pre-Vatican II ecclesiology more faithfully or more responsibly set forth than in Joachim Salaveri's De Ecclesia Christi on the Church of Christ in the first volume of the so-called Spanish Summa. Salaveri discusses the issue of canons versus chapters at Trent and Vatican I in some detail, citing a great number of sources. Despite the debate in previous centuries, he asserts that theologians are now unanimous in holding that infallibility is not limited to the canons alone. The canons express doctrines negatively by condemning falsehoods, while the chapters teach doctrines positively. However, in the chapters, the infallible definitions only occur when a doctrine is taught quote, assertively, directly, and principally, end quote. The arguments and reasons offered for such doctrines, along with the orbiter dicta, are not infallible. He quotes Franzelein's statement that theologians are free to assign significant weight to such material, as long as they stop short of claiming that they are infallible. What response is owed to authoritative non-definitive teachings? Salaveri quotes several previous writers on this question including some that say it is permissible to doubt such a teaching in the presence of weighty reasons against it, and others who do not. His own opinion is not clearly stated. In an earlier article, Salaveri had proposed a new scheme of theological notes as a replacement for the traditional system. These new notes used terminology found in Tuas Libenter and the documents of Vatican I, Avoiding one-word notes such as error that might be confusing for those who did not realize that such words were being used in a technical sense. This system was apparently not well received, and Salaveri did not include it in the Sacre Theologia Summa. Instead, he gives a more standard table of 28 censures and positive notes and explains their various meanings. In a footnote elsewhere in the book, he mentions that these can be taught infallibly, quoting the so-called clarification that Gasser gave five days after his original relatio. Salaveri also repeats Gasser's statement that the extent of the primary and secondary objects of infallibility are identical for papal and episcopal teachings. Additional manualists. Several other writers of seminary manuals will be briefly considered here. 
Concerning the infallibility of the minor censures, several opinions were in circulation. Matthias Josef Schaben, 1835 to 1888, agreed with Franz Lein and below that when minor censures were used in a papal or conciliar condemnation, they were infallibly taught and binding on the faithful. Adolphe Tancre, Society of St. Sulpice, 1854 to 1932, takes a more nuanced approach. He considers it a common and true opinion that the censures proximate to heresy erroneous in faith, and false, can be issued infallibly, but argues that temerious, offensive to pious ears, and improbable cannot be, because these notes do not seem to define a doctrine. Still, one is obligated to give religious assent to the judgments of the Church in such cases. Francis Sullivan, Society of Jesus, born 1922, who authored the very last Latin seminary manual, holds that in the chapters of a conciliar text, any doctrines that are clearly taught as something to be held by the faithful are taught infallibly, but that the arguments from scripture or tradition, illustrative examples, and orbita dicta are not. More generally, he argues that definitions must be identified by a study of the wording and the context. That is, a pope could define a doctrine in an encyclical, even though such letters are not typically used for this purpose, as long as his wording is made clear in his intention. Sullivan's later writings will be examined in chapter 3. In the 20th century, the list of theological notes was expanded. The note indicating a definitive dogma had traditionally been de fide, but this was now rephrased as de fide divina et catholica to distinguish it from definitive non-revealed doctrines, that is to say, the secondary object of infallibility, de fide ecclesiastica. A new note was added to indicate non-definitive authoritative teachings, doctrina catholica. This term appears in the works of Salaveri, Sullivan, Timetio Zapronera, Society of Jesus, 1883 to 1962, Geraus von Nort, 1861 to 1946, and Sisto Cartaccini. Perhaps the name was derived from the use of this phrase in Franzelein's manual, as mentioned earlier. Schlagenalfen, however, labels non-definitive authoritative teachings as doctrina communis et satis certa, commonly and sufficiently certain doctrine. Two different names were proposed for the censure deserved by an assertion that contradicts non-infallible authoritative doctrine. Zappelena, Salaveri, and Sullivan use Eronea in Doctrina Catholica for this category, while Cartaccini uses at least Temaria. The addition of these notes indicates the greater attention being paid to this kind of doctrine. Nonetheless, creating one single note for all non-infallible authoritative church teachings meant that the system of theological notes was still not useful for distinguishing weights within this category. Other writers after Vatican I. Some additional writers from the late 19th and early 20th century will be briefly examined here. John Henry Newman. John Henry Newman was born in London in 1801. As one of the founders of the Oxford movement, he played a key role in the development of Anglo-Catholicism, although ultimately Newman himself joined the Roman Catholic Church in 1845. He was created cardinal in 1879, died in 1890, and was beatified in 2010. Between 1865 and 1867, anticipating a possible definition of papal infallibility, Newman began writing a pamphlet about this topic. Although this project was abandoned, his draft and notes were preserved by the Birmingham Oratory. In this unfinished work, Newman states that the Council of Trent was infallible in its canons, but not in the chapters prior to the canons, or in their reasons, or in their orbiter dicta. Newman justifies this by citing a number of theologians and noting that the majority hold that the canons alone are de fide. In his letter to the Duke of Norfolk, written after the definition of papal infallibility at Vatican I. Newman argues that the distinction between canons, chapters, reasons, and orbiter dicta applies equally to conciliar and papal definitions, going so far as to mention specific errors in the reasons, although not defined teaching, in the definitions of Ephesus.
431, and Nicaea 2, 787. He does not, however, address the general question of the weight of authoritative, but not infallibly taught doctrines. Considering whether the minor censures can be issued infallibly, Newman seems to lean against this possibility without giving a definite answer. When the Church states that certain doctrines are temerarious or offensive to pious ears or scandalous, it is making assertions that necessarily vary with time and place. Lucien Chopin Lucien Chopin was born in 1859. He taught moral theology and canon law at the Jesuit Scholasticate in Hastings, England, and subsequently the Scholasticate at fourvel lyon He died in 1932. Chopin's Valère de Decisiones Doctrinales et Disciplinares du saint Seguier went through three editions between 1907 and 1928. Although a scholarly work, it was widely read in France. Chopin devotes nearly half the book to the syllabus of errors, analyzing each condemnation in the context of the earlier document in which it first appeared. Given the doubts that French Catholics then had about participating in the Third Republic, this focus is not surprising. He concludes that the syllabus does not itself impart infallible authority. The contradictories of certain propositions in the syllabus are indeed truths of faith, but this is because they were taught infallibly elsewhere. Chopin considers several different theologians' explanations of the authority of encyclicals. He concludes that although they do not contain infallible teaching, they do have significant weight. The adherence required by an encyclical is not the same as the adherence required in a formal act of faith. Strictly speaking, this teaching could be subject to error, we have a thousand reasons to believe it is not. Such a thing has probably never happened, and it is morally certain that it never will happen. But speaking absolutely, it could happen, in the sense that God does not guarantee this point of teaching in the way that he guarantees a teaching formulated in the manner of a definition. Willem von Rossum Willem Marinus von Rossum Congregation of the Most Holy Redeemer, was born in 1854 in Zwolle, Netherlands. He taught at the Redemptorist Scholastica in Whittem, Netherlands, from 1883 to 1892. In 1896, having relocated to Rome, he became a consultor to the Holy Office. Created Cardinal in 1911, he served as President of the Pontifical Biblical Commission, 1914 to 1932, as a prefect of the Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith, 1918 to 1932. Von Rosum died in 1932. In his work, De Essentia Sacramente Ordinis, Von Rosum explores the topic of the matter of the Sacrament of Holy Orders. This was a disputed topic, and there were magisterial teachings that could be brought to bear on various sides of the issue. As a result, even though the focus of his monograph was not the theology of the magisterium, von Rosum is frequently forced to assess the magisterial weight of particular teachings. One document of particular concern is the Bull of Union with the Arminians, Exultate Deo, written in 1439 and associated with the Council of Florence and Pope Eugene IV. One passage in this document asserts that the matter, materia, of the sacrament of holy orders is the handing on of the instruments. In the case of the priesthood, this means the handing on of the chalice and paten. Von Rossum argues that this doctrine is not being taught definitively, based on a number of factors, such as the fact that Exultate Deo was not addressed to the Catholic bishops or to the Catholic faithful, but merely to one Oriental church, and on the lack of reception of this teaching by future generations in the church. Therefore, it is taught only with the church's ordinary and fallible authority, ab ordinaria ac fallibii ecclesia ac toritate, and given sufficient reasons, a Catholic can disagree with this teaching. Von Rossum also argues that when Roman congregations address particular cases, the resulting documents are more practical than doctrinal. Such documents may have a guarantee of safety, but they do not have a direct guarantee of truth. On this point, Von Rossum's view is close to those of Franzelein and below.
Gerardus von Nort, J. P. Verhar, John J. Castellot, and William R. Murphy. Gerardus von Nort was born in 1861, Hageveld, Netherlands, and was ordained a priest in 1884. From 1892 to 1908, he taught at a seminary in Warmon, Netherlands, where he wrote his 10-volume textbook on dogmatic theology. He died in 1946. During von Nort's lifetime, some volumes of his textbook were updated by Johannes Petrus Verhaar, born 1889. Real Fardensveen, Netherlands, died 1948. His colleague at Warmond. Von Nort's original text discusses non-definitive doctrines briefly in terms that are now familiar to the reader. That is, such doctrines result from a pope who teaches with less than the full authority available to him. The Catholic faithful owe religious assent, ascensus religiosus, to such doctrines. When grave objections appear, an individual Catholic can withhold this assent and merely observe a reverent silence. Such cases are extremely rare. He states that encyclicals generally contain non-definitive doctrines, and the theological note Doctrina Catholica is used to designate such teachings. Verhaar's updated text preserves this material without changes. After the deaths of von Nort and Verhaar, the text remained quite popular, and the task of preparing an English translation was given to two professors at St. John's Provincial Seminary in Plymouth, Michigan, John J. Castellot, Society of St. Sulcis, Professor of Scripture, and William R. Murphy, Society of St. Sulcis, Birth and Death Dates Unknown, Professor of Dogmatic Theology. Castellot and Murphy expanded and revised the book significantly. In their discussion of non-definitive teaching, Castellot and Murphy criticized Doctrina Catholica as being not a true theological note. They see it as a catch-all term that can be given to a long document such as an encyclical by theologians who are unwilling to go through the text and assign a specific note to each assertion found therein. The apparent implication is that certain non-definitive teachings could be given more precise notes than Doctrina Catholica, but the authors do not mention what these notes would be. A new section by Castellot and Murphy discusses Catholic teaching on the relation between church and state. This section includes a detailed analysis of the authority of Pope Leo XIII's teachings on this topic in his encyclical Immortale Dei, 1885. The analysis by Castellot and Murphy is quite detailed. First, the authors discuss the authority of encyclicals in general. These contain the public teaching of a pope, not merely his private opinion. The most authoritative encyclicals are those sent to all the bishops of the church, as was Immortale as was Immortale Dei. Second, they examine the language Leo uses in Immortale Dei. Over and over again in the encyclical, he refers to the fact that he is exercising his apostolic office of teacher of the entire church. Secondly, that, he, that his teaching on church and state is ultimately grounded in revelation and sound philosophy. Castellot and Murphy also point out that Leo is discussing church-state relations throughout the Catholic world, not just in one country. Third, they state that all theologians, from canonists from Leo's own day to the present, refer to Leo's teachings as the classic source of the Church's teachings on relations between church and state, and offer a long list of such writers. This material constitutes an analysis of the reception of Leo's teaching, although the authors do not use this word as it had not yet become a common theological term. Fourth, they indicate that a series of popes have issued the same teaching. Leo XIII quoted two of his predecessors' writings in his encyclical, and his successors, Pius X, Pius XI, and Pius XII, cited Leo's teaching as authoritative. Castellot and Murphy concludes that Leo XIII's teaching on this matter has a great deal of authority, yet their final conclusion is quite terse. It is Catholic teaching, Doctrina Catholica. This phrasing illustrates the limitations of the terminology of that era. Earlier, these two authors had argued that Doctrina Catholica was an imprecise catch-all term for whatever was found in an encyclical. Their careful evaluation of Leo's teaching should have enabled them to say something more specific about its weight, 
but lacking more precise terminology, Castellot and Murphy settle for this vague label they could have assigned to the entire, they could have assigned to the encyclical even without a detailed analysis. Charles Journet. Charles Journet was born near Geneva in 1891, was ordained in 1917, and taught theology at the Grand Seminare in Freiburg from 1924 to 1970. Journet served on the Vatican II Preparatory Commission that drafted the original schema, De Ecclesia. In 1965, Pope Paul VI created him a cardinal and titular archbishop, enabling him to make several interventions during the final sessions of the Council. Journet died in 1975. Journet, in his master work, Le Eglise de Verbe Carne writes that the Church can infallibly issue the minor censures. These lesser notes do not indicate a less irrevocable censure, but merely indicate that the claim being censured is contained within the deposit of revelation with a greater degree of implicitness. The Church can condemn infallibly and absolutely as rash, sets proposition, for example, as the last judgment will or will not take place at such and such a date. In this case, she pronounces in an absolute manner, not on the date, but which remains uncertain, but on the temerity of those who predict it. Moreover, he argues that even when the Church issues prudential judgments and disciplinary decrees that are not infallible teachings, they are still guaranteed to be prudent, possessing what he terms prudential infallibility, as long as they are addressed to the universal Church. He cites Franzelein as the source of this argument. Humani generis and its aftermath. The obligation of the Catholic faithful to accept non-definitive church teaching was mentioned occasionally in papal documents between 1870 and 1950. One important passage appeared in the encyclical Immortale Dei, Leo XIII, 1885. If in the difficult times in which our lot is cast, Catholics will give ear to us as it behooves them to do, they will readily see what are the duties of each one in matters of opinion as well as action. As regards opinion, whatever the Roman pontiffs have hitherto taught or shall hereafter teach must be held with a firm grasp of mind and, so often as occasion requires, must be openly professed. Another such passage appears in the encyclical Casti Conubi, Pius XI, 1930. To her, the Church, therefore, should the faithful show obedience and subject their minds and hearts so as to be kept unharmed and free from error and moral corruption, and so that they shall not deprive themselves of that assistance given by God with such liberal bounty. They ought to show this due obedience not only when the church defines something with solemn judgment, but also in proper proportion, when, by the constitutions and decrees of the Holy See, opinions are proscribed and condemned as dangerous or distorted. However, none of these passages suggested that there was a diversity of weights to non-definitive doctrinal teaching. That possibility was implied for the first time in Pope Pius XII's 1950 encyclical Humane Generis thus, Although this sacred office of teacher in matters of faith and morals must be the proximate and universal criterion of truth for all theologians, since to it has been entrusted by Christ our Lord the whole deposit of faith, sacred scripture, and divine tradition, to be preserved, guarded, and interpreted, still the duty that is incumbent on the faithful to flee also those errors which more or less approach heresy, and accordingly to keep also the constitutions and decrees by which such evil opinions are proscribed and forbidden by the Holy See, is sometimes as little known as if it did not exist.' 
what is expounded in the encyclical letters of the Roman pontiffs concerning the nature and constitution of the church is deliberately and habitually neglected by some with the idea of giving force to a certain vague notion which they profess to have found in the ancient fathers, especially the Greeks. The popes, they assert, do not wish to pass judgment on what is a matter of dispute among theologians, so recourse must be had to the early sources, and the recent constitutions and decrees of the teaching church must be explained from the writings of the ancients. Although these things seem well said, still they are not free from error. It is true that popes generally leave theologians free in those matters which are disputed in various ways by men of very high authority in this field, but history teaches that many matters that formerly were open to discussion no longer admit now of discussion. Nor must it be thought that what is expounded in encyclical letters does not of itself demand consent, ascensum, since in writings such letters the popes do not exercise the supreme power of their teaching authority, for these matters are taught with the ordinary teaching authority, magistero ordinario, of which it is true to say, He who heareth you heareth me. And generally, what is expounded and inculcated in encyclical letters already, for other reasons, appertains to Catholic doctrine, doctrinum catholicum perennet. But if the supreme pontiffs, in their official documents, in actis suis, purposefully pass judgment, data apare sententiam fuerunt, on a matter up to that time, under dispute, it is obvious that that matter, according to the mind and will of the pontiffs, cannot be any longer considered a question open to discussion among theologians. In the wake of this document, two fundamental interpretations of the last sentence arose. In one interpretation, Pius XII was saying that the doctrinal teaching found in encyclicals and similar documents was divided into two categories assertions intended to close discussion in a controverted question, and assertions written without such an intention. And the former had greater weight than the latter, although both categories remained non-definitive. In the other interpretation, Pius XII was saying that an assertion intended by a pontiff to close discussion was itself infallible and definitive, whereas other assertions in encyclicals were not. By the established principles of the theology of the magisterium, this question could have been resolved if it were known exactly what Pius XII meant when he referred to such an assertion, being no longer open to discussion. If he meant that no Catholics were free to challenge or obstinately doubt such an assertion at any time in the future, then he was by definition saying that the assertion was definitive. But if he meant only that theologians were no longer free to publicly debate this question, or to advocate a position contrary to that of such a pope, or that the question was not open to discussion at this time, then Pius was not referring to definitive teaching. As the text was unclear on this point, theologians tried to determine Pius's meanings from clues in the text. At the 1951 convention of the Catholic Theological Society of America, Edmund D. Bernard, 1914 to 1961, of the Catholic University of America, presented a paper arguing that Umane Generis was not in this passage referring to definitive teaching. Bernard admitted that a pope could, if he so chose, include an infallible definition in an encyclical, as long as the wording of this definition made his intention clear. But Pius XII was not referring to that possibility. Rather, Pius was referring to a weighty but non-definitive exercise of his magisterium. Since this remained non-definitive, it could not produce certitude that the proposition being taught is true, but it did allow Catholics to assent unconditionally, with no fear of error, to the fact that the opinion the Pope sets forth is well-founded and safe. Did this apply to all assertions clearly made in encyclicals? No, only to a definite, direct statement, which clearly and with recognizable intention applies to a hitherto controverted matter, which does, at least implicitly, manifest his will that the controversy be closed. Nonetheless, as this was not infallible teaching, a theologian might privately discover problems with the teaching, in which case he should respectfully contact the Holy See. Bernard's proposal was similar to Franz Alain's so-called infallible security discussed earlier. Another American, 
Joseph C. Fenton, 1906 to 1969, of the Catholic University of America, criticized this concept as too weak, preferring Below's claim that encyclicals could contain infallible teachings even when they do not contain definitions in the strict sense. It appears that Fenton understood Franzelein's so-called security as meaning that one needed to assent to the safety of such teachings but not to their truth, whereas it appears to me that Franzelein was saying that Catholics should assent to the truth of non-definitive authoritative teachings, and if they do so, even though there is no absolute certainty that that the teaching is true, one can be absolutely certain that by assenting to the teaching as true, one will not imperil one's soul. Fenton, on the other hand, approaches the question from the perspective that any teaching which is not certainly true will inevitably be doubted by many Catholics, and these Catholics will then turn to theologians to determine which parts of an encyclical they are free to ignore. Therefore, doctrines directly taught in papal encyclicals should be treated as infallible. Fenton even extended this to papal allocutions on the grounds that even if a pope speaks to a small audience, the subsequent publication of his allocutions in the Acta Apostolicae Sedis meant they are addressed to the universal church. Another proposal in circulation during this era was that even though a pope might not teach infallibly in a single encyclical, whenever the same doctrine was taught in a series of encyclicals, it must be taken as definitive. Paul Now, Order of St. Benedict, 1901 to Unknown, offers several arguments in favor of this thesis. One is a mathematical analogy. Just as a series of numbers can approach a definite limit, so a series of encyclicals can so-called converge to define doctrine in a manner of an asymptote. When this happens, Catholics can be certain this doctrine is true. A second argument is based on a comparison between the teaching authorities of the bishops and of the pope. Theologians agree that the bishops can teach infallibly in two ways, by issuing a solemn judgment in council, extraordinary magisterium, or by unanimously teaching a doctrine while dispersed throughout the world, ordinary magisterium. They also agree that the pope can teach infallibly by issuing a solemn judgment ex cathedra, extraordinary magisterium. By analogy, therefore, the Pope must be able to teach infallibly using his ordinary magisterium, and this can be accomplished repeating the same teaching forcefully several times in a row. This infallibility also applies to a series of encyclicals written by different Popes. Now also minimize the chance of error in the Pope's non-infallible teaching. Such error was theoretically possible, but surely this does not happen more than twice or thrice in a thousand years. Moreover, whatever opinion one may profess on the infallibility of the Pope, it is just as disrespectful to proclaim publicly that he can be wrong as to say to children, your parents may be lying to you. Joseph Fenton had earlier offered a similar argument. Although the Church might come to modify its stand on some detail of teaching presented as non-infallible material in a papal encyclical, he wrote, it is not possible that any subject treated extensively in a series of papal letters directed to and normative for the entire church militant could be radically or completely erroneous. Other theologians in this era were more open to the possibility of errors in the Pope's encyclical. G. Absolene, for example, pointed out significant differences between Proventissimus Deus, Leo XIII, 1893, and Divino Aflante Spiritu, Pius XII, 1943, in their principles for scriptural scholars. Granting that these differences might be labeled so-called development of doctrine, Absolone nonetheless insisted that these two encyclicals disagreed on certain specific points. Even so, he is firm in stating that theologians who have doubts about the content of non-definitive teaching should deal with these issues quietly rather than publicly. Franz X. Earth, Society of Jesus, died 1963, professor of moral theology at the Jesuit Theologate in Falkenberg, Netherlands, and later at the Gregorian, was a consultant to the Holy Office and one of the ghostwriters for Costi Conubi. In 1952, he published transcriptions of two allocutions by Pope Pius XII and attached a note concerning their magisterial weight. In this note, he states, that when such allocutions involve matters of faith and morals, the faithful must give internal and external submission, 
but are not required to give absolute or irreformable assent because they are not set forth with supreme authority at the highest level, and for that reason infallible certitude is not extended to them. Conclusion By 1962, the existence of non-definitive authoritative papal teaching was universally recognized. It was distinguished on the one hand from a pope's definitive teaching, including the primary and secondary objects of infallibility, and on the other hand from doctrinal teachings addressed to only one portion of the church, disciplinary legislation, and his writings as a private doctor. Such teaching could be recognized because it satisfied the criteria for universal doctrinal teaching. It concerned fides et mores, and was addressed to the whole church, but did not satisfy the criteria for infallible teaching. Theologians differed on the border between these categories, but on the basic picture there was unanimity. Did all non-definitive authoritative papal teachings possess the same authority, or did some have more weight than others? Many theologians had addressed the question of how Catholics should respond to teachings in this category, but most of their writings seemed to assume that this category was uniform throughout. Indeed, all teachings in this category were now labeled with a single theological note, Doctrina Catholica. Yet, there had been some progress on this question. It was recognized that teachings issued by Roman congregations and approved by the Pope in forma communi carried less weight than those issued by the Pope himself. Umani generis seemed to distinguish between authentic teachings intended to close a debate and those that were not. Several criteria could be used to weigh such teachings, as shown in the example from Castellot and Murphy's update of von Nort's book. And, of course, a Pope might use an explicit theological note to indicate a proposition's authority. Much less had been written about non-definitive authoritative conciliar teaching. Of course, it was recognized that a council could teach non-definitively by attaching a specific theological note to an assertion, but when a council issued an assertion regarding fides vel mores without such a qualification, the assumption among theologians, apparently unanimous if the survey given in this chapter is any indication, was that it was an infallible definition. The theological note, Doctrina Catholica, does not appear to have ever been used for conciliar teaching and the theological position that infallibility extended only to the canons, not to the chapters of a conciliar text, had fallen out of favor. For both papal and conciliar teachings, nonetheless, it was recognized that the arguments offered for a teaching were not themselves infallible, nor were the illustrations and examples or orbiter dicta. This seemed to imply that there was some conciliar teaching that was non-definitive but authoritative, unless perhaps these reasons and orbiter dicta possessed no authority at all? Friends aligned indicated that they did have authority, sometimes even great authority, but did not expand on this claim. And what could be said about the arguments made for a non-definitive teaching? Did these have less weight than the teaching itself, and yet still significant weight? These and many more questions had been implied, but apparently not examined by the theologians who had written about the magisterium before 1962.